Good morning, and welcome to the Unitarian Society of New Haven, or USNH. I am Rich Stockton, a member of the Worship Committee and your Worship Associate today. If you're joining us for the first time, we're so glad you chose to spend this time with us. And happy Valentine's Day. We meet electronically for now, but we look forward to being together again in person. Some of us are bringing our best selves to this space, and some of us are bringing our struggling selves, including pieces we might be ashamed of. All of us are welcome here, and on every day, including Valentine's Day, all of us are loved. Some of us already have open hearts, and some of us aren't quite there yet because our hearts have gotten a little beat up this week and might have forgotten how to trust and open. Your heart is welcome here. No matter how bruised, we welcome you. This is a covenantal congregation that believes in beloved community, that all people are inherently worthy. The first two goals in our covenant are to be open and to value differences. You can go to our website, usnh.org, to find out more about us. And if you click on online services, this will tell you how to join a Zoom meeting after the service to be part of a weekly welcome quarter visitor chat. You can view the announcements at the end of the service and in our newsletter. And one final item of note, our February drive through will be this Saturday, the 20th, from 9.30 to 11.30. Please read more about that in the newsletter. The call to worship comes from the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu, chapter 78, translated by Stephen Mitchell. Nothing in the world is as soft and yielding as water Yet for dissolving the hard and inflexible, nothing can surpass it. The soft overcomes the hard. The gentle overcomes the rigid. Everyone knows this is true, but few can put it into practice. Therefore, the master remains serene in the midst of sorrow. Evil cannot enter his heart. Because he has given up helping, he is people's greatest help. True words seem paradoxical. Welcome to this sacred time together. Let us light the chalice, symbol of our Unitarian Universalist tradition. When strangers meet, endless possibilities emerge. Each is called to serve something larger than the self. Today, this morning, let us light the chalice for openness, for willingness to grow, for rich curiosity, and for common purpose. serenity. 
Serenity was born in the worst year of a long war. In her earliest memories, the distant sounds of conflict mixed with the sweet lullabies that rocked her to sleep each night. Now, ten years later, there was an agreement to stop fighting. It was a time to rebuild broken homes and streets, but everyone in Serenity's life knew that the fighting could start again at any moment. And this made them all very nervous and very worried all the time. When thunder rumbled down from dark clouds, Serenity looked to the sky for planes. When holidays came, the fireworks that had been central to past celebrations sat unused on the shelves because no one could bear the sound of them. The war had been between Serenity's people and others who shared the rolling hills of this precious cratered homeland. But the others used to have a different leader years ago in a time long abandoned. That was the only thing that separated them. The lines on the map had changed many times, and obviously some people remembered the old lines, while others thought about the new lines, often running between buildings that were built by the same hands. As hard as she tried, as much as she listened to her beloved grandparents talk about why the others must not be trusted, Serenity just could not understand how to hate them. She just wasn't any good at it. Many times she had accidentally played with the others before being pulled away by angry parents. One time she had accidentally gone to the wrong store for milk and eggs before being told to get out and buy them on her side of the invisible line. Still, the divisions eluded her, and she quietly, secretly loved everyone, even though she was scolded for it time and again. The day arrived when someone said something in a speech that angered the others, uncovering an old injury that seemed to be healed, but it turned out was just covered over. Later, no one seemed to be able to recall exactly what had been said, but it definitely was insulting if you interpret it the way that it was interpreted by the interpreters, who were experts at inferring interpretation. Within minutes, both sides of the street, on both sides of both major cities in this place, were filled with enemies each waiting for the other to do something that would start the fight again. Words were thrown. Words were thrown back. Anger was fed like a wildfire by these words, and before long, the words turned into rocks and stones, bottles, and anything else they could lay their hands on. People were hit. People were hurt and it felt like it was only going to get worse. Serenity had been pushed outside by her family, and she found herself standing, blinking in the middle of the street, with nothing in her hands but the flower that she had been drawing in her room. There was a rock lying on the pavement by her feet, and some voice a voice that she couldn't tell if it was coming from within her or coming from somewhere around, told her to pick up the rock and throw it. On the other side of the street was a shop owned by one of the others, and in the windows of this shop were all kinds of colorful, exotic plants and beautiful paintings, kind of like the one she had been creating just minutes before. One of her friends from school stood next to her in that street, aiming a rock at the shop, arcing her arm back to build up force. Wait, Serenity heard herself say, why are we doing this? Please don't throw that rock. The friend looked confused, hesitated for a moment, but I have to, 
Everyone around is doing it. If I don't, you know that the others will, and they will win. Or, shouted Serenity over the no noise, perhaps if we don't, maybe they won't either, and then we both will win. Her friend froze, as though the words hit with more force than anything that was whizzing through the air around them. Her friend dropped the rock and took Serenity's hand instead. They crossed the street and placed the flower that Serenity was holding on the ground in front of the shop. They turned and went back inside. The next day, things were calm again. Another tense, temporary peace had settled. Many rocks had been thrown. Many windows were broken. Many people and many more feelings were hurt and in need of care. Serenity met her friend, and they ventured out to see what was still unbroken in the world. They were amazed to find that while so much damage had been done to people and places everywhere in their community, the shop across the street was untouched, unshattered, and unchanged, except for that one plant that was missing from the day before. The two girls smiled, knowing that this tiny corner of peace, the only one in the city, was there because of them. Imagine how much wider they smiled when they turned to go back inside, and there in the doorway of their own building, among the broken glass, was the missing plant from the shop. It was a tall, snow-white lily with broad green leaves rising directly from the soil. Attached was a note that read, A single stone unthrown just might save us all. Now, as it turned out, the fighting between Serenity's people and the others did not stop. In different ways, it kept popping up. Many more people were hurt, many more windows were broken, and more of what went around came around. But you know what? Bit by bit on that one corner of that one street, the shop with the flowers in its windows and the girl with the flowers in her mind never threw another stone. Some of the other people on both sides of the street stopped throwing stones and began throwing hope instead. Among themselves, they began to whisper that perhaps they had both won in this way. Did they stop the war? Did they live happily ever after? Not exactly, but incredibly, bit by bit, day after day, more and more of them began to believe that it was possible. Hello, my name is Linda Pollock, and I am a member of the Pastoral Care Team. In this spiritual community, we remind ourselves each week that joy and woe are woven fine. Some of us bear burdens made lighter as others help us carry them. Some of us hold joys that shine more brightly as others reflect our delight. With sadness this morning, I share that Paula Mattern, a longtime member for over 50 years, died peacefully in her sleep on January 31st. A memorial service will take place at some future date at USNH. Together, let us give thanks for this community of care. A reminder, if you would like your joy or sorrow read aloud in our Sunday services, please send them to pastoral care at usnh.com by Thursday of the preceding week. I invite you into a practice that I learned from the Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker. It reminds us of our universalist forebears, 
who believed in a love that would not let us go, no matter what. Please repeat each phrase after me. There is a love holding us. There is a love holding all that we love. There is a love holding all. We rest in this love. Let us spend some time in silence, resting in this love. There is a love holding all. We rest in this love. Blessed be. church 
a second home from birth. I learned my UU values by osmosis and through wise teaching in Sunday school. USNH feels a lot like that birthplace church. It is a place where I can learn and feel safe in my explorations, where I can sing my joy and my sorrow, where friends can be found and wit and wisdom enjoyed. If I need a shoulder to lean on, shoulders are offered in abundance. If I want to share my triumphs, others will share my joy. If I need hope and inspiration, USNH is the place to find them. This is what I personally get from USNH and Unitarian Universalism. It's why I've stuck with it over the years. And it's what inspires my financial support. That first church, my beloved community of origin, instilled in me a sense of responsibility for the world, a feeling that I should be part of a shared effort to make the world a better place. I believe that the values and teachings of the Unitarian Universalist faith have much to offer the world, particularly in this moment, when reality for so many is whatever they declare it to be. It is sometimes said that we can believe whatever we want to believe. This skates too closely for me, to me, to the notion that the American ideal of freedom means that we can do whatever we want, run amok, hate people whom we don't understand, and storm the Capitol. As you use, we can each decide what we believe in, but implicit in that is a responsibility to think deeply about what we embrace as our faith. We need to anchor reality in the truth as it is possible to know the truth and strive to weave the truth into our beliefs. Let the warp of our weaving be the verifiable truth and the woof be those discoveries and experiences that are beyond explanation. The shift our culture has taken shows the importance of the UU commitment to seeking the truth. We don't just believe whatever we want, but we do believe in the quest for truth while remaining firmly on the path of love. USNH represents me in the larger community in ways I don't always have the bandwidth to participate in other than through my pledge. My pledge also supports the denomination and its larger bullhorn for promoting our vision of what the world should be. Through USNH, I know more about where I live. I know better how to live. How can I not support such a place? It expands my life, my love, and my knowledge. It challenges me and leads me to more complete understanding. I wouldn't want to live without it. As Linda stated, as Unitarian Universalists, we can't just believe whatever we want. But I do believe that we can make a difference in each other's lives. I firmly believe that. Some of that is be, by being there for each other in difficult times and celebrating each other in times of joy. And yes, in the, the generosity that flows from our gratitude for this community when we give each Sunday. So I encourage you to be as generous as you can, either by going to our website and clicking in the upper corner where it says donations, or by sending your gift to 700 Hartford Turnpike in Hamden, Connecticut, 06517. Thank you for your generosity.
Today's reading is A Norwegian Teacher's Defense of Education by Rivera Sun. In April 1940, the Nazis invaded Norway and occupied the country. Early in 1942, as part of an, an attempt to implement a fascist curriculum in the schools, Minister President Vidkun Quisling, a Norwegian collaborator with the Nazis, disbanded the existing teachers' union and required all teachers to register with the new Norwegian Teachers' Union. This prompted the nonviolent Norwegian Teachers' Defense of Education movement. Close to 10,000 of Norway's 12,000 teachers responded by signing a letter of refusal to cooperate. The Quisling government panicked and closed the schools, sending the children home to their parents. 200,000 of these annoyed parents wrote letters of protest to the government. Norwegian teachers began to hold classes in secret in defiance of orders. The government ordered the arrest of a thousand teachers, 500 of whom were sent to a prison camp in the Arctic. As the trainloads of teachers were shipped north, students and families gathered along the tracks, singing and offering food to the teachers as they passed. Once in prison, the teachers formed choirs and offered lectures to one another in order to maintain their sanity and pass the time. The government tried numerous intimidation tactics, but the teachers' strike continued. They would not join the new union. On November 4th of 1942, the Quisling government abandoned their earlier plans for the new teachers' union and released all the teachers. The Norwegian teachers, through nonviolent resistance, had defended their youth from being subjected to fascist curriculum and protected Norway from sliding into a fascist state. The Norwegian Teachers' Defense of Education offers pearls of strategic wisdom for us as we see a rise of bigotry and hatred in the United States. It was not individual action that produced such a successful campaign, but rather collective action through an entire profession supported by students and parents.
We can't focus an entire month on beloved community without talking about nonviolence, which is central to Martin Luther King Jr.'s vision of it. Indeed, he believed that the purpose of nonviolence is the creation of the beloved community. And nonviolence isn't just about the way you act, it's about who you are. It isn't just an organizing tactic, it's a way of life. I know I have changed in response to studying the lives of people like Dr. King, Gandhi, Dorothy Day, Cesar Chavez, and others. A recent experience showed me just how much nonviolence has gotten into my bones. I was playing an online video game with my son, and uh, you know there were designated good guys and designated bad guys, and um, I wound up shooting up one of the cartoonish avatars. And I have to tell you, I was distraught. Not just uneasy, but shaken and openly weeping. It's, it's hard to convey why I was so upset. Because, but even though it was just a game, I'd somehow crossed some internal line. Now, another example of this kind of evolution, only with much higher stakes, comes from Camilo Mejia, an Iraq war veteran. When he enlisted at age 19, he believed that if the U.S. went to war, it would be for a good reason. And then they started gearing up to go to Iraq. He, didn't, he, he opposed the war politically, but it didn't affect him much personally. He thought he could push his principles aside, get the war over with and move on, but nothing could have prepared him for the reality. Mejia eventually became a conscientious objector while he was still in the U.S. Army, and all the things he'd feared might happen if he refused to keep fighting did come to pass. He was called a coward. He was called a traitor. He was accused of desertion. He was tried and convicted in a court-martial and he spent a year in jail. And as he tells the story, he'd never felt freer in his life. For him, there was no higher assertion of his freedom than to follow his conscience. Following the path of nonviolence requires courage and serious self-discipline. There's nothing weak or passive about nonviolence nor about the love that sustains it. According to King, the nonviolent resistor has deep faith that justice will eventually win. During the Civil Rights Movement, major preparations and training went into every action. Working in community was crucial. People would learn logistical basics, do role plays, talk about the why and when of singing, get instructions on dealing with the press, and so on. The woman who integrated the University of Alabama trained for two years beforehand. And one of the most difficult aspects of nonviolence is to focus your anger on the system rather than on people. Gandhi wanted to better the lot of those who were suffering. For him, poverty was the worst form of violence. At the same time, he was also concerned with the dignity and humanity of the oppressor. King put it this way in, where do we go from here, chaos or community? And I say to you, I have also decided to stick with love, for I know that love is ultimately the only answer to mankind's problems, for I have seen too much hate. I've seen too much hate on the faces of sheriffs in the South. I've seen hate on the faces of too many Klansmen and too many white citizens counselors in the South to want to hate myself. Because every time I see it, I know that it does something to their faces and their personalities. And I say to myself that hate is too great a burden to bear. The means of victory are always embedded in the ends that result. We must resist evil without becoming evil ourselves. 
Now, let me be clear that there's a huge difference between advocating nonviolence from a place of privilege versus committing to it from a place of oppression and pain. If you have your foot on my neck, it's up to me to decide the best way to get it off. That said, research shows that on the whole, nonviolence is a far more effective tactic than violence when it comes to social transformation. In their book, Why Civil Resistance Works, The Strategic Logic of Nonviolent Conflict, Erica Chenoweth and Maria J. Steffen look at aggregate data from 323 violent and nonviolent resistance campaigns that took place between 1900 and 2006, systematically comparing outcomes in different historical periods and geographical contexts. They use resistance to describe major non-state rebellions, either armed or unarmed. They identify campaigns, a series of repetitive, durable, organized, and observable events directed at a certain target to achieve a goal as the main unit of analysis and measure effectiveness by comparing stated group objectives to policy outcomes. The authors explicitly recognize that Characterizing a campaign as nonviolent or violent simplifies a complex constellation of resistance methods. If you're interested in the details of their methodology, they lay everything out clearly. Now, taking all of this into account, Chenoweth and Stefan found that campaigns of nonviolent resistance were more than twice as effective as their violent counterparts in achieving their stated goals, 53% compared to 26%. By attracting impressive support from citizens whose activism takes the form of protests, boycotts, civil disobedience, and other forms of nonviolent non-cooperation, these efforts help separate regimes from their main sources of power and produce remarkable results. Nonviolent resistance presents fewer obstacles to moral and physical involvement and commitment, and higher levels of participation contribute to an enhanced resilience greater opportunities for tactical innovation and civic disruption, and therefore less incentive for a regime to maintain its status quo, and shifts in loyalty among opponents' erstwhile supporters, including members of the military establishment. Chenoweth and Stefan conclude that successful nonviolent resistance ushers in more durable and internally peaceful democracies, which are less likely to regress into civil war and that violent insurgency is rarely justifiable on strategic grounds. Now, the vast majority of participants in nonviolent struggles have engaged in strategic nonviolent resistance rather than the principled nonviolence of Gandhi and King. Both, though, both, though use widespread non-cooperation and defiance without the threat or use of violence to achieve their goals. Now, one of the reasons I wanted to use a story from World War II as our reading this morning is because so often people up bring up the Nazis as justification for war. Now, I wanted to raise up instances of nonviolence being effective against them. And the story from Norway is not the only example. Villagers in Le Chambon sur Lignon in France quietly saved about 3,500 Jews between 1940 and 1945. In Berlin, the Rosenstrasse protest by German women married to Jewish men also saved thousands of lives. People in Denmark hid their Jewish friends and neighbors in their homes, and fishermen ferried them to safety in nearby Sweden. Only a few hundred of the country's entire Jewish population died in the end. Now, could the Third Reich have been overthrown entirely that way? I don't know the answer. I do know that Camilo Mejia brings up a critical question in the documentary Soldiers of Conscience. People tell me, you know, what would have happened if Hitler was not stopped? Well, what would have happened if there would have been enough conscientious objectors in the Nazi army? There would have been no war. There would have been no Hitler. There would have been no Holocaust. If you believe that there can never be enough people who are conscientious objectors to stop a monster like Hitler, then it's never going to happen. 
First, you have to dream it. Then you have to live your dream and make it happen. We have to believe that. If we don't believe that, and if we don't have that dream, and if we don't live up to that dream, then how are we going to survive as a human race? The movie notes that in Germany in 2004, 150,000 people were called up for mandatory national service. Of those, 70,000 served as soldiers, while 80,000 served as conscientious objectors, working in non-military institutions. Maybe Mr. Mejia's dream is closer than we think. It's important to remember that all of the great change makers whose stories we tell were ordinary people. They became extraordinary when they let themselves be used for a greater purpose. They were able to set aside their personal agendas long enough to let a larger love work through them, which in turn was energizing and sustaining. They lived with integrity, not perfection, but integrity. One question that has plagued me over the last few years is what happens to nonviolent resistance when your opponents seem to have no integrity? or at the very least are willing to ignore their consciences to pursue their selfish goals, whatever the cost. How can moral suasion work on people who demonstrate a lack of moral compass? As I've watched recent victories for fairness unfold despite widespread efforts to suppress them, the record voter turnout in Georgia leaps to mind, I'm reminded of one of my all-time favorite physics metaphors. F equals MA. Force equals mass times acceleration. There have been so many forces out there trying to push us into the past on voting rights, on international asylum agreements, on climate change, and many, many more. When we're trying to counter people in power who would use force against us, it feels, can feel like we're pushing back about on so many fronts that we can't build up enough speed to make a difference. Here's the thing, though. If you can't increase your acceleration, then you need to increase your mass. You need to get more people involved. You need to have more and more communities joined in solidarity and pushing back against oppression. Those recent victories I mentioned are rooted in relationships. A voter receiving a handwritten postcard in the mail, or getting a phone call to help them find their polling place, or talking with a volunteer at a campaign event. And those relationships, those brief approximations of beloved community, add more mass to the mass movements for justice. I want to point out something in this formula that looks tiny, but has significant implications. Do you see those little arrows above the F and the A? They indicate that force and acceleration are vectors, which just means that they have a directionality as well as a magnitude. Now how that applies to our metaphor is that as we add more and more people who are going in the same direction as we are, who are pushing with the same purpose, our collective forces become focused, our collective force becomes focused and moves us closer to the beloved community. And when the force we exert is motivated by love, if it's Gandhi's Satyagraha or soul force, then the ends we achieve are imbued with love rather than tainted by violence. When have you felt that kind of love for your fellow beings? What gets in the way of allowing a larger love to flow through you? What would you sacrifice or refuse to sacrifice for such love? Maybe not all of us can have the kind of historical influence that Dr. King had, but we can all be part of building the beloved community. 
After all, before Dolores Huerta helped organize the United Farm Workers, she was a teacher. Before anyone had heard of Dorothy Day, she was a single mom. Before Desmond Tutu's name became well known, he was a priest. Ordinary people who committed themselves to a larger purpose. So why not you? Why not me? Why not us, together? Each of us always has access to that greater love. It's woven into the fabric of the universe, and nothing we do can either earn it or lose it. All we have to do is remember. As the hymn assures us, there is more love somewhere. When we make it manifest in our relationships and institutions, in every corner of our world, then the beloved community will be realized. And can you imagine what comes next? Amen. Ashe. And blessed be. There is more love somewhere. There is more love somewhere. I'm gonna keep on till I find it. There is more. We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts until we are together again. Every day we get to choose anew how we will be in the world. We can choose to be an instrument of peace. We can choose to act with compassion and integrity, we can choose to manifest that larger love. So let us go forth, my friends, with courage and with kindness to be a blessing to the world. Amen, Ashe, and blessed be.